Good afternoon and welcome to this hearing on the Committee on Standards and Ethics. I am Council Member Steve Matteo, I'm Chair of the Committee. We've been joined by my colleagues Karen Kozowitz, Vanessa Gibson, Margaret Chin, and Barry Grudenchik. Today we will be holding a first hearing on Intro 1272 sponsored by Council Members Barry Grudenchik and Mark Levine in relation to amending reporting and donor disclosure requirements for organizations affiliated with elected officials. In 2016, in response to public concern over the potential for people doing business with the city to use donations to organizations affiliated with elected officials to gain influence with such elected officials, this committee passed Local Law 181. That law established reporting requirements on do donations for all organizations affiliated with elected officials. It also required that any organization that spends more than 10% of its expenditures on elected official communications is subject to a restriction on the donations it can receive from persons doing business with the city. While the basic structure of that law has so far seemed to be well balanced, we have heard concerns from unrestricted organizations about the administrative burdens that complying has created for them. These are organizations that are not involved in elected official communications but are still subject to the law's reporting requirements. We expect some of them to testify here today. The introduction being heard today, which I will let the sponsor speak more fully on in a moment, would address these concerns by amending the reporting requirements of unrestricted organizations to establish a threshold of $5,000 for the reporting of donations. It would also require organizations to ask donors on a donation form if they are the spouse, domestic partner, unemancipated child, or parent of a person doing business with the city. However, with the exception of anonymous donations, it would not require organizations to verify whether such persons or any other persons were doing business with the city. This bill would place responsibility for determining if a donor is doing business with the city with the Conflict of Interest Board, similarly to how the C Campaign Finance Board makes such determinations based on candidate filings. I want to thank the members of this committee and the sponsors of this bill for their work on these issues. I also want to thank the staff who worked to put today, to today's hearing together, Serena Longley, Deputy General Counsel, Brad Reed, Senior Legislative Counsel, Michelle Lee, Senior Legislative Counsel, Benjamin Smith, Assistant General Counsel, and Rob Newman, Counsel to the Speaker. Finally, I want to thank the Conflicts of Interest Board for joining us today, and at this time, I'm going to hand it over to um, Council Member Barry Grudenchik. Thank you, Chair Matteo. Um, thank you for holding this hearing and for doing it so quickly. Um, this is a time-sensitive matter for the conservancies that are affected. Um, in 2016, the Council enacted Local Law 181 to regulate and add transparency to donations to non-for-profit organizations associated with New York City elected officials. The law requires reporting and public disclosure of donations to not-for-profit organizations deemed controlled by city elected officials or their agents and limits permissible donations to some of these entities. Local Law 181 also tasked the Conflict of Interest Board to promulgate rules necessary for the implementation of the law. Among the rules prom promulgated by the COIB were rules one, establishing procedures for obtaining a determination from the COIB that an elected official or an agent of an elected official does not exercise control over an entity, and two, delineating factors by which the board will determine whether an entity is affiliated with an elected official. Earlier this year, it was brought to my attention that COIB's interpretation of Local Law 181 would require institutions such as Parks Conservancies to file voluminous following, filings, filings excuse me, if they are deemed to be affiliated with a city elected official. This would be required even though their mission and function were in no way political. After meeting with several organizations that were deemed to be affiliated with a city elected official or feared that they would be deemed affiliated with a city elected official, it became obvious to me that the New York City Council needed to protect entities that have absolutely no political mission or objective. After speaking with my colleagues and former colleagues who voted for Local Law 181, I came to believe it was not the legislative intent to ensnare entities like park conservancies and entangle them in what I deem to be needless paperwork and filings. These entities do great work and we should not hinder that work with needless red tape and bureaucracy. Hindering these nonprofit organizations is, in my opinion, akin to killing the goose that laying golden eggs across the city of New York. I have worked very closely with the Council Central staff on a solution that lessens the burden of Local Law 181 and ensures that conservancies and other non-for-profits that have no political mission or objective will not be hampered from doing the great work that they do. 
I look forward to hearing the opinion of the many stakeholders who are gathered here today. And I ask, I will ask later, uh, where will this end? Because many, many of the cultural organizations that do business in this city uh, could also be ensnared. I have visited since I became Parks Chair earlier this year, many parks, including Central Park, Prospect Park, Bryant Park, Madison Square Park, Brooklyn Bridge uh, uh, Park, Governor's Island, Alley Pond Park, Cunningham Park, Van Cortland, Pelham Bay, Astoria Park, Randall's Island, Riverside Park, and others, over 80, not all of them run by conservancies, but many of them affiliated with friends groups. We're gonna hear from them today and what an imposition of a burden would be to them um, and I want to thank again Chair Matteo and the other members of this committee for convening this hearing today. So I'm ready, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Gronachek. We're going to start with uh, the Conflicts of Interest Board, uh, Caroline Miller and Ethan Carrier. And before you begin, my council is going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Great. Thank you for being here. And you could uh, move forward with your testimony. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Matteo, uh, members of the Committee on Standards and Ethics, uh, Council Member Rudenchek. I am Ethan Carrier, the General Counsel of the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board. With me is the Board's Executive Director, Carolyn Lisa Miller. We are here on behalf of COIB to offer testimony about Intro 1272. Since the enactment of Local Law 181 of 2016, codified at Chapter 9 of Title 3 of the New York City Administrative Code, which I'm just going to call Chapter 9, CYB has been hard at work implementing the new reporting and donor disclosure requirements for organizations affiliated with elected officials. CYB has adopted board rules and has advised elected officials and affiliated organizations about their responsibilities under Chapter 9, conducting numerous in-person training sessions for the representatives of affiliated organizations. These experiences with Chapter 9 provide us with unique insight on the impact that its reporting requirements, as well as the amendments to those reporting requirements proposed in Intro 1272, will have on affiliated organizations, uh, their donors, and the city. Chapter 9 was enacted to close a regulatory gap identified in connection with the Campaign for One New York, CONI, by providing certain donations to organizations affiliated with elect an elected official that spend at least 10% of their annual expenditures on communications featuring the name, voice, or likeness of the elected official. Such organizations are defined in our rules as restricted organizations. Chapter 9 also requires all organizations affiliated with elected officials or their agents, including those that do not meet the 10% threshold, which we've uh, defined as unrestricted organizations, to report for public disclosure certain donor information. Although Chapter 9 focused on concerns raised about CONY-type organizations, the committee report for Intro 1272 acknowledges that Chapter 9, as currently written, requires unrestricted organizations to report the same information as a restricted organization. Specifically, the unrestricted organization must report a donation in any amount from someone listed in the city's doing business database or from the spouse, domestic partner, or unemancipated child of someone listed, as well as all other donations of $1,000 or more. This poses a significant burden on the organizations that the legislation was least concerned with, some of, those, uh, some of which are small, not-for-profits, with few staff to manage compliance with Chapter 9. The board adopted rules implementing the textual requirements of Chapter 9 nearly one year ago, rules that apply to restricted and unrestricted organizations alike. Since then, and after uh, having engaged with and trained affiliated organizations on the requirements of Chapter 9 and the corresponding board rules, 
We strongly believe that Chapter 9 should impose fewer, if any, reporting requirements on unrestricted organizations. Many of these organizations do important work on tight budgets, forcing them to use their limited resources on a disclosure regime that does not substantially further the council's policy goals is an undesirable goal, uh, undesirable outcome for everyone. In addition, and in light of the concerns raised by both unrestricted organizations and by the council in the committee report, we intend to engage in rulemaking to ensure that the reporting process is not unnecessarily complicated. COIB supports the council's efforts, efforts to reduce these burdens on unrestricted organizations. The most indirect effective way to reduce those burdens would be to remove unrestricted organizations from Chapter 9. However, if the council wishes to retain Chapter 9's jurisdiction over unrestricted organizations, COIB has some general ideas on how to amend the law to balance the dual goals of transparency and reducing the burdens on unrestricted organizations. We stand ready to work with uh, work collaboratively, collaboratively with the council to help craft legislation that effectively advances these shares, shared goals. Uh, in our testimony today, we offer three broad ideas as well as a more detailed list of drafting suggestions for implementing these concepts and for fixing some of the structural inconsistencies in intro 1272. That list can be found as an addendum to the testimony. Uh, number one, remove family members from disclosure regime. Based on the feedback CYB has received, unrestricted organizations almost universally consider it particularly burdensome to obtain and disclose information about a donor's family members. The law should not require an unrestricted organization to report whether a donor is the spouse, domestic partner, or unemancipated child of a person listed in the city's <coughs> doing business database. The political campaign of a candidate for city elective office does not need to report to the campaign finance board or otherwise inquire whether a family member of a contributor is listed in the doing bus business database. Unrestricted organizations should not be subject to a stricter disclosure regime than in the Campaign Finance Act. Number two, remove doing business database from disclosure regime. Because the doing business database is publicly available and the proposed amendments would require the Chapter 9 public disclosures to be machine readable, journalists, good government groups, and other motivated members of the public would be able to compare donor information released against the doing business database. It should not fall either on unrestricted organizations or COIB to do so. We believe that the council's goals are achieved simply by the disclosure of donor information and that our limited taxpayer resources should be focused on administering this aspect of the disclosure regime. <coughs> Number three, increase reporting threshold for unrestricted organizations. COIB supports intro 1272's proposal to increase the reporting threshold from $1,000 to $5,000 below which unrestricted organizations need not disclose any information about donors. As stated in the committee report for intro 1272, the board in advisory opinion number 2003-4 selected this amount as the appropriate threshold for public disclosure. In conclusion, we welcome a reduction of chapter nine's reporting requirements for unrestricted organizations and are eager to work with the council to implement these changes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I have some questions before I turn it over to my colleague, Councilmember Grudenchik. Um, how many organizations did you contact to tell them they are covered by Local Law 181, and how many organizations disagreed with the assessment? And, um, and of those, how many did you open and decide are not covered by the law? Um, I, I think we contacted probably over 100 organizations. Um, I, I don't have the exact figures on who we ultimately determined. Uh, how many did we contact? Probably about a couple dozen we determined were not covered by the law. I don't have the exact figures. You said, I'm sorry, you said a couple dozen? Yes. Okay. And any of those disagreed with the assessment? I meant to say a couple dozen we determined were not covered by the law, so if they they wouldn't have disagreed with the No, but I believe you said a couple. I'm just trying to go back to what you said first. Uh, okay, it was a couple. Yes, yes. Some did disagree, and, and we've been in discussions with them. Ultimately, it would be a board decision. Um, 
So with the organizations that were, were that were reporting under advisory opinion 0304 automatically considered to be covered under local law 181? Every organization we we provided notice to as the law requires and each organization either registered, in other words, did, chose not to challenge that uh, initial determination or engaged with staff to uh, reach some other conclusion, providing information about their corporate structure um, and other sort of details about how the organization functions. Right, okay. So in the context of parks organizations, can you describe the most relevant factors in determining if they are covered under local law 181? Uh, the, the factors that are detailed in the rules are the factors the board. The same rules that you use? Yes. Okay. Um, what is your process for handling the reporting of anonymous donations under advisory opinion 2003 and 4? The, the process that the board utilized was similar to the process that's contained within the annual disclosure law, that the, the entity would make a representation that a particular donor needed to have um, anonym, needed to have privacy based on some threat, um, and then the board would make a determination about that. So how, how often have organizations asked for anonymity for a donor, and what are the reasons they gave? The, um, <laughs> not that frequently have, okay. have the organizations asked the, what the reasons they gave would be confidential. But you, not, not many, you said? Or? Not many, no. Okay. In, in the 15 years that since 2003-04, there have not been very many requests for privacy. Um, and in prom promulgating the rules for 181, what was the board's reasoning for establishing the numerous steps that unrestricted organization must follow to determine if a donor has business dealings with the city? The, um, the critical issue for the steps is, is, is the fact that the definition of doing business with the city within the law itself includes the family members of the donor. So for an organization to make a determination about whether a donor is doing business with the city, it's not the straightforward check of the doing business database. The organization also has to determine whether the donor's a spouse, domestic partner, or unemancipated child is in the doing business database. And it's that piece of information that required the extra step. And the law also doesn't require unrestricted organizations to use the donor submission form that it requires of restricted organizations. And we were informed that because the law only requires that of restricted organizations, the Conflicts of Interest Board couldn't implement a rule that required unrestricted organizations to use that form. So we had to be creative um, in cr crafting a process that no doubt is cumbersome to sort of solve those two issues. Okay, great. Um, just joined by Council Member Levin, Levine, and Cohen. I'm going to uh, hand it over to um, my colleague, Council Member Barry Grudanchik, for some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here today. Um, as Parks Chair, uh, I am most concerned about <laughs> the conservancies, which bring in well over nine figures to the city. There's never been a hint of a scandal. Um, they run, they do a beautiful job, and um, if they were not here, the city would be on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars that they raise annually, God bless them. So my first question um, to you, um, why do you think this law applies to the conservancies? I know you may have explained it a little in your testimony, but um, if you could tell me how you got there and whether or not the, the, the board actually took a vote on this or this was an interpretation. Uh, well, the, uh, the, I mean, the, the factors set forth that if an elected official or his or her agent, which would include uh, the commissioner of an agency, um, uh, meet any of the, fact, you know, meet the factors of control, um, then the organization would be covered by Chapter 9. You don't think that's a, a stretch, or uh, I, I, I am very concerned here well, that look, you're going to hear from the panel. I hope you'll be here to hear from them, but it, it is uh, a tremendous regulatory burden, which you acknowledge in your testimony. And I, I guess um, in the middle of your testimony, uh, Council, um, you said that the Conflict of Interest Board, paragraph 3 on page 2, supports the council's efforts to reduce the burdens on unrestricted organizations, which are conservancies, and I appreciate that. 
Um, the second sentence of that paragraph, the most direct and effective way to reduce those burdens would be to remove unrestricted organizations from Chapter 9. Is that a suggestion to us? Do you su would you support that if we decided to go ahead and do that, if we amended the legislation? Is that something that the Conflict of Interest Board could live with? Oh, I, I certainly think we could live with that, and I, I, I certainly agree with you 100%. These organizations are, you know, this, this – Legis this bill, 181 of 2016, and uh, and the, the board rules that we promulgated, doing our best to try to implement the letter of that law, um, you know, do create a really significant regulatory burden for these organizations. And I also agree, we've not had any experience of scandal or problems with these organizations. Um, and uh, if, you know, in the in trying to find the right balance between, uh, I think, a, a, a noble goal of providing some transparency about the flow of money here and the concern about how burdensome that is, um, I, I, I do not think it's an unreasonable conclusion that um, at, least this, at least this law is not the way or place to, to do this, and maybe this law should focus on the uh, what we call restricted organizations, the Coney type organizations, right. the ones that are engaged in these kinds of communications uh, about which the council appeared to be concerned in passing 181, um, that maybe leaving that uh, in this bill is the best thing for this and dealing with the other question in some other um, way, uh, some other place is, uh, uh, is maybe the better, better process. All right, I appreciate that because I, you know, it, it, it has dawned on me and others that um, I understand you have a job to do and I respect that and I fill out my form every year on, on time, always on time. Um, but it seemed to me that the, this interpretation was um, basically a solution looking for a problem. And I realize that your agency is tasked with a very hard job um, in keeping our ethics as high as they possibly can be, and I support that mission, and I think everybody here does. Um, but it just, for me, the, what I've heard from the people over here um, and people who are, could not be here today um, is that this is, is a big burden. Uh, some of the bigger conservancies, uh, they have more money, but there are at least 17 conservancies that raise a million dollars, um, many of them raising well above that, and I think Central Park is the largest, but um, there are just so many in this city, and um, I'd be happy to give you a tour if you ever want, but I don't think you need that of some of those parks uh, and the work that they're doing. Um, I am also concerned, and we're not here to talk about that today, but is it possible that this law could ensnare other organizations, such as some of our cultural institutions that sit on city land um, and might, and also take, you know, they raise a lot of money privately, but they also get um, either free rent from the city or um, or their direct funding that they receive. And there are a lot of them. I don't want to really name them, but you know we do know the organizations that they are. I, I don't see that as a, a substantial concern. I mean, we've had also a lot of substantive, detailed conversations with some parks organizations, and probably similar to the one uh, that your office and you have had. Uh, so we, we, we understand some concerns. There's a history with the board in dealing with the Parks Department and some of these parks conservancies that led to this specific result that I don't think would be the same result with other kinds of cultural institutions. And we've received a lot of education from these um, entities, the parks conservancies, that I think uh, we're still in discussion in terms of the, at least the piece about the coverage of the law. I think we we're, we're sort of have a mutual understanding about the reporting requirements. Well, I, am, I, for one, uh, am happy to hear that you would support carving out the conservancies uh, from this law um, because I think that would probably be the best solution. And I want to thank the chair for having this hearing today because I know that uh, some of the rec reporting requirements are due to start uh, with the beginning of the new year, which is 28 days away. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to ask those questions. I'm looking forward to hearing more questions from my colleagues here, and thank you for being here today. Thank Absolutely. Thank you, Councilmember Kornacek. Um, sorry for the oversight, Councilmember Lander, that I missed you before. You are here, <laughs> and you are up for questions. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Chair Matteo, and uh, thank you to the sponsor, Councilmember Grudencic, and 
Councilmember Levine, uh, thank you for being here. Um, and I really want to mostly associate myself with, uh, with the comments just made by uh, Councilmember Grudenchik, which I understand to be proposing an amendment to the bill that's before us, so I just want to make sure I understand it all together. So, you know, when we, I, I was a strong supporter and co-sponsor of the, the law that we passed. In, in my mind, we were quite narrowly focused on the, you know, issue advocacy organizations, the Campaign for One New York, and um, where we really saw a lot of issues, and we thought there was an important loophole to close. And to me, that was about these two, that had two tests. One, are they controlled by an elected official? And two, do they spend money on, uh, in the ways that were described in the bill, on sort of, you know, elected official advertising issue advocacy? Uh, and that was the combination that we were looking to address. I understand that I'm, you know, and, and that was what I thought we had done. Uh, I hear you and I understand why you feel we did not do that as precisely as we should have. And I'll own that. I voted for that bill. I co-sponsored that bill. I see why it was vague. So even if I wish you had ruled that it did make those distinctions, you know, I, I, I see where it was vague and it is necessary for us to add those two. Um, but if I understand what you're saying rightly, you know, I, I think I share your opinion that what we should do is clarify that we meant those organizations that spend in the ways described. And for those organizations like the conservancies and plenty of other organizations, um, that's sort of a different set of questions with a different set of problems that we're trying to, to and, and that for this bill, like let's keep it more narrowly focused on those elected official affiliated issue advocacy groups with the same regime in place, you know, and then those groups that are elected official affiliated but don't do this kind of issue advocacy or elected official advertising would simply not be covered by this particular regime at all. So that's what you're essentially saying you would also be comfortable with. Is that right? Right. I'm, I'm saying I, I, at, least as, at least as we've, uh, at least as this has been executed in 181 of 2016 and, and maybe even with these amendments, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it feels like maybe the, uh, the, the sort of transparency value to burden ratio is, doesn't quite work. And maybe that's because this bill was really about the Coney type organizations. And, yep. and, and maybe um, the other issue is better tackled in some other way in some other place. And just from a kind of technical point of view, what that would mean is sort of leaving this, you know, putting in this sentence that's at 3902A, adding all organizations affiliated with an elected official and then adding that spend or reasonably expect to spend at least 10% of the expenditures in their current or next calendar year on the production or dissemination of elected official communications, adding that in. So it was clear that those are the organizations that are covered, but not necessarily then adding in this whole section that follows under 10B, just sort of leaving that maybe for a subsequent conversation. Uh, at a, at a, at a Right, at a quick glance, that's, that looks like that would be basically what, what it would look like, yeah. Right. Well, uh, I, I could certainly support that, Mr. Chair, and to the bill co-sponsors more at this point, importantly, um, to the extent that I heard you to be, exp you know, uh, pushing that uh, idea. I'll associate myself with those, uh, uh, with those feelings and would certainly co-sponsor uh, and be enthusiastic about passing that bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Blander. Uh, Councilman Levine. Um, thank you very much, Chair Matteo, um, and, and thank you to uh, Chair Grudenchik. And um, I'm going to continue in the vein of the, the um, comments made by my two colleagues and just emphasize that this was a law intended to rein in people giving to an entity to curry favor with the mayor or giving to an entity that was influencing the political process outside of oversight from the Campaign Finance Board. Parks and Services don't in any way interfere with the political process, and I think it's pretty absurd to think that someone would give to a Parks Conservancy to curry favor with the mayor um, for obvious reasons. You can hear some, some faint chuckles in the audience. Um, when this was first proposed, um, did you all uh, – during the review of the original legislation, alert us to the unintended broad 
reach of the proposal? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I know that in our testimony we, in 2016, we suggested that the unrestricted organizations, and they weren't, they weren't called that then, we hadn't come up with that term for them then, but uh, uh, shouldn't be subject to the same sort of uh, reporting requirements that the restricted pony type organizations should be. Um, and we, uh, and the board in its rulemaking uh, uh, initially made uh, some efforts to try to make that happen by rule, uh, but the conclusion was that that was not possible because of the letter of 181 of 2016. So we were, uh, our hands were a little bit tied about, uh, about that re re reporting requirement. I mean, I, I wish this had all been aired during the original legislative process. We could have saved a lot of heartache in the meantime. Uh, and I appreciate your attempts to lower the reporting requirements on unrestricted, but I have to say, really, the only acceptable thing would just be to take them out. These, some of these are small nonprofits. They have limited staff. Um, this really would be uh, uh, an undue burden on, on those nonprofits. And since there's no, in my opinion, public policy justification for it, the solution has to be to take them out. And I'm very, very happy that I think you said in your opening remarks has been um, reiterated in, in the previous questioning that you now would favor simply removing uh, the unrestricted entities from this legislation and that we can do that uh, legislatively through uh, amendment to the bill that is currently being heard today. Is that right? Uh, right. I mean, I, I think that as it is now, it would probably be a, a better thing to remove them from this and if you want to address this issue to address it in some other bill that's about this issue rather than having it be part of a bill that's about these more restricted Coney type organizations at the very least. Got it. So uh, you're, you're saying that it would, it would not be appropriate to insert into the bill we're hearing today, but that it would be a separate bill? It, f it feels like it's, um, it's it, that the unrestricted organizations have uh, sort of suffered in their regulatory burden a bit by being part of a bill that's Got it. not really about them. And, and that um, if, if you wanted to um, do something about transparency of flows of money from not-for-profit organizations, maybe this isn't the um, best way or place to do that. My understanding is that, that um, museums and similar cultural organizations are not currently uh, listed as part of the unrestricted category. Is that right? Um, I, I, right. I, my, uh, my understanding, and, and uh, my colleague can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is that, the, that the, by and large the museums and cultural organizations that we, the COIB has not viewed them as being covered by this um, but some of them do have ex officio board members appointed by a commissioner or the mayor. Yes, that, that's true, they do. Yeah. So why would they be exempt if not, and Parks Conservancy is not? I, I just, uh, I, I don't want to, again, many of the discussions that we've had with individual organizations are confidential just as required by our law. Um, but, but we're talking about a whole class here. No, 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 I understand. But I, to speak with any specificity about different organizations, but uh, as I said before, there's some, we've had historically a unique, the Co Conflicts of Interest Board has had specific rulings over the course of many years um, at the request of the Parks Commissioner for um, parks employees to be working for these, for parks conservancies as part of their city jobs, to be paid by the conservancies. And there has been a sort of, entanglement of purpose between the conservancies and the parks department um, for the benefit of the city, but that's the history that the board has brought to thinking about the application of this law. Now we've had a lot of conversations with different um, folks that are here that help us to think about some of those questions a little bit differently, that maybe there were certain representations made for certain reasons based on certain provisions of the conflicts of interest law and there might be different applications now, but, but there's historical reasons based on the sort of closeness in relationship between the conservancies and the parks department that have, have led to some, as a general matter, to some of those conclusions. And I just wanted to sort of add to what my colleague said, th these organizations have been the subject of like conflicts of interest board interest for many years since this advisory opinion 2003-4. So it's not like the conflicts of interest board ever thought this wasn't an appropriate subject of disclosure and legislation and some kind of transparency initiative. It's just whether this is the right tool, 
you know, this is the right hammer for the man. But what's new is the individual contribution disclosure requirements, right? That was never, that's never been applied before. It, there was a different kind of disclosure requirement that was required through the city agency. Okay, well, we'll hear from some of the affected entities shortly. I hadn't heard that the more general requirements in effect for several years were a source of, of um, problems for, for the conservancies. Um, it does seem like what was proposed here, more intense and focused on individual contributors, definitely was. And as for cultural institutions, um, I think it's great that they are not covered. I don't want them to be covered. But whatever logic you use to exclude them seems to me would apply to conservancies. There are a lot of them, a lot of the cultures are on public land. A lot of them have 100 year agreements with the city or more. Um, and many of them have ex officio board members. Uh, so it's hard for me to see how one group would be uh, excluded and not the other. And you did reference operating agreements, which um, you can have with, the, with, with parks entities. But again, let's remember, this was about worried that people are giving to curry favor with the mayor and worried about political activity, which I don't see how an operating agreement would have any impact on any of those considerations. So. Um, but I, I, I don't want to bury the headline, which we're very happy about, which you all come into the hearing and uh, endorse in the notion of excluding the unrestricted groups. So we have mechanics to work out there and work as quickly as we can for the benefit of the sector. But in the meantime, there's an existing rule in place. And I'd like to say that by uh, Wednesday at noon, we could have our bill passed, but that's probably not going to happen. So could you explain to us um, how we can shield groups from undue burdens um, while we're waiting to work out uh, a legislative fix. Well, the, the reporting requirements as they presently exist um, uh, require the reporting to be uh, done by August of 2019, so there's a bit of time before those reports have to actually be made. Um, in order to comply with that, there's a lot of information that needs to be collected, collected now, right? right? But um, collected starting when? Uh, January of uh, of this of, year, oh, of, 18, of right. 2018. So, um, so there's uh, uh, so that collecting of information needs to be ongoing now to comply with the reporting that will happen in August of 2019. But uh, but no, nothing actually is required to be reported until yeah. then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, endorsing the carve out. And um, I'm going to pass it back to Chair Matteo. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Levine. Uh, Councilmember Grudenchik for one more follow up. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Steve, for stealing this, for Mark for stealing my thunder there. Because uh, I was concerned. Some of the um, conservancies um, were under the impression, at least they related to me, that they would have to start reporting January 1st, but we're clear that that wouldn't take place till the 1st of August now. Well, that's what the law requires. Right. The reporting is due August 1st, but it's right. for the full calendar year of right. 2018. Okay. So they would have had to be gathering the information okay. during the past. Okay, so that, uh, and, I, and I do want to hit upon what he said also, that um, there are so many culturals that are on city land. Um, just think about Flushing Meadow Park. We have the theater, we have the zoo, we have the Botanical Garden um, and others. Um, so that would be a great concern to me as well, um, not to mention Central Park and other parts of New York City that have many, many cultural organizations that serve tens and hundreds of millions of people a year. So I want to thank you for your testimony um, today and for being here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Carol. Appreciate you being here and answering our questions. Uh, the next panel is going to be Mark Haken, Friends of Cunningham Park, Nicole Brostoff, I apologize if I say your name incorrectly, Riverside Park, uh, former Commissioner of Parks, Adrian Benepe, Trust for Public Land, Deborah Meyer, Randall's Island Park Alliance, and Lynn Kelly, New Yorkers for Parks. I think we need one more chair up there.
commissioner, you could start. I'm still going to call you commissioner. You were commissioner of parks when I was the chief of staff. So welcome, and go ahead, Adrian. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chair Matteo, uh, Park Chair Gradenchik, Council Members uh, Levin and Levine. I noticed your, your colleague Lander had to leave. I thought this, con this hearing is brought to you by the letter L. <laughs> Um, I also want to uh, thank Chair Miller of the COIB and for your um, extraordinary openness to making changes. And um, thank you for this opportunity to testify in Local Law 181. My name is Adrian Benepe. As some of you may recall, I served as New York City Commissioner of Parks and Recreation for 11 years between 2002 and 2012. Prior to that, I served in a variety of roles covering 34 years for the Parks Department, including six years as Manhattan Borough Parks Commissioner and also oversaw the Art and Antiquities and Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources Divisions. Uh, between city jobs, I worked at a high level for two New York City nonprofits, the New York Botanical Garden and the Municipal Art Society. I currently work as Senior Vice President and Director of National Programs for the Trust for Public Land, overseeing our National Urban Parks Program. In that capacity, I've gained a good deal of knowledge about how cities across the country manage and fund their parks and especially the role that park conservancies play in improving and managing parks. In fact, I helped create a report we did on conservancies called Public Spaces, Private Money, The Triumphs and Pitfalls of Urban Park Conservancies. There's a link uh, that you can find online. I will mail you hard copies. Uh, I'm here today to urge the City Council to amend the law passed in relation to the campaign finance donations to elected officials which in my expert view may have been too broadly written, allowing a mistaken interpretation by the New York City Conflict of Interest Board. Plainly speaking, the COIB interpretation of this law requiring the, release, the releasing of details of thousands of donations and donors to park conservancies is a solution in search of a problem. Worse, it will create mountains of unnecessary work for both conservancies and for the administrative agencies. Much worse still, it will likely have a chilling effect on donations that provide crucial restoration, upkeep, and programming for a few dozen parks in New York City, ultimately perhaps forcing the city to spend more scarce public dollars or allowing those parks to fall back into disrepair. I speak from an almost unique perspective as I was present at the founding of the first major park conservancy in the world, the Central Park Conservancy in 1980. As you know, that model has spawned more than a dozen others here in New York City and ultimately several hundred in cities across the country. In New York City alone, conservancies provide between $150 and $200 million a year for the improvement, maintenance, and programming of public parks. And last year, according to the Trust for Public Lands Park Score Analysis, conservancy partnerships and scores of cities across the country provided more than $750 million in private voluntary contributions to public parks. Now, to put that funding in context, the money raised and spent by conservancies in New York City would represent a 40% addition to the city dollars spent by city government on parks using tax dollars. Now, if those private donations were to disappear, the city would be forced to reallocate public funding from within the parks department's budget or perhaps from other city services. More likely, I'm afraid, what we would witness is a swift decline in park conditions to those we all saw in the 1970s and 1980s, when the New York Times headlined its three-part expose in October 1980 on the terrible conditions of the entire city park system, which sadly we all remember. New York City park system stands as a tattered remnant of its past. And it was precisely in response to those terrible conditions, even in world-famous parks like Central Park and Prospect Park, that the first conservancy was created through the leadership of Elizabeth Barlow, now Betsy Barlow Rogers, then the leader of the nonprofit Central Park Task Force and the first administrator of Central Park. And she worked hand in hand with then Parks Commissioner Gordon Davis and Mayor Ed Koch. The rest is history as they say, it led to things like immediately thereafter the Prospect Park Alliance and many, many others. Over a billion dollars has been raised since then through entirely private, entirely voluntary, charitable contributions made to these independent 501c3 organizations. And that's the key concept I'd like to highlight. These are not donations to elected officials, to city officials. They are not donations to candidates for elected office. 
They are not donations to city agencies or to commissioners. They are private gifts to nonprofit organizations that are not controlled by the mayor or by any other elected or appointed officials. Now, I know all of this perhaps better than anyone in this room or the city because in my 27 years as a city official at the Parks Department, I was an ex officio trustee of more than 75 nonprofit organizations that sat on city parkland or in city owned buildings or that provided a variety of work and service for the city. I also assisted in the creation of conservancies, five of them, including the City Parks Foundation, the Historic House Trust, the Fort Tryon Park Trust, the Natural Areas Conservancy, and the Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy. Let me add uh, to that discussion about anonymous donors. People don't give anonymous donations uh, because they're under threat. They give anonymous donations because they don't want to be besieged by other worthy causes. So there's a very long and venerated tradition of nonprofit groups being allowed to accept anonymous donations. I have also worked for park-related nonprofits for over 12 years, and I'm, I have become, I guess, a national expert providing nonprofit consulting services to citizens and cities in the creation and functioning of park conservancies. And I was recently in Raleigh, North Carolina, and working on one there. So here's the bottom line as I see it. There has not been one allegation that a donation to conservancy was made to a mayor or other elected official, nor is there any evidence that the mayor or other elected officials control any of the conservancies. These conservancies are and always have been valued partners to the city. They are not in any way agents of the city. And to impose these completely unnecessary and burdensome regulations in park conservancies would likely have a chilling effect on their abilities to fundraise. It's precisely because those donations are not going to the mayor or to the government that most donors make these charitable contributions. Because I've learned, for better or worse, it is my experience that donors do not trust government to spend their donations wisely. Moreover, it is puzzling to me that this regulation and the COIB, as some of your uh, members have pointed out, would single out Park Conservancy donors for this level of scrutiny as the city also works in partnership with hundreds of nonprofit organizations in hundreds of locations, from the museums, performing arts organizations, zoos and botanical gardens, to hospitals, social service agencies, and many, many more. So would the city council apply this regulation and COIB impose this interpretation on those organizations as well? I urge the city council to amend its well-intended law, and I commend you for that law, uh, and amended to omit the independent nonprofit park conservancies from this requirement. I also urge the COIB, and I thank them for their openness to this, to see the light and revisit the issue and end this interpretation and reporting requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Matteo. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Nicole Brostoff, and I'm here representing the Riverside Park Conservancy, or RPC, a private non-for-profit organization that provides supplemental services to five parks along the Hudson River in Manhattan. While we very much appreciate the City Council's willingness to address the applicability of Chapter 9, Title 3 of New York City's Administrative Code to the Park Conservancies, we strongly disagree with the Conflict of Interest Board's determination that the law applies to RPC in the first place. As written, the law applies to entities that are controlled by the mayor or his agents because of the council's stated desire to curtail unlimited and undisclosed fundraising to groups controlled by public officials. As I will explain in detail, the RPC is not controlled by the mayor or the parks commissioner. Accordingly, we believe the most proper route here would be to not otherwise weaken a good law, but instead carve out the conservancies like ours that are so clearly not controlled by the mayor or his agents. Applying this law to our conservancy would be an overwhelmingly burdensome to our small staff. We have donors who routinely make gifts at the $5,000 level. A bench donation to adopt a bench in memory or in honor of a loved one in the park, for example, costs $7,000 today. Requiring us to report on one of those gifts, as well as to request the donors disclose their spouse, their domestic partner, their unemancipated child, and or their parent, would not only take many hours uh, every week, but it would also likely turn people off from giving generously to support the park in the first instance. Ultimately, it would mean that we can do less work to support the park, and we know that's not the council's intent. And it's simply not necessary to apply that burden to us because as noted earlier, the RPC is not controlled by the mayor or the parks commissioner. RPC and the parks department have a close affiliation and partnership 
but NYC Parks does not and cannot direct the Riverside Park Conservancy. Parks has jurisdiction over Riverside Park and appropriately sets only those rules about what activity can take place within the park, but also the contours of the service that RPC can provide in relation to the park. This is set forth in a carefully negotiated arm's length license agreement. NYC Parks and RPC are, present, are presently negotiating a new license agreement to cover the next 10 years and it would, has been painstakingly negotiated between councils to the parties over the last nine months. While the license agreement defines the outside limits of RPC's activities, it does not dictate those activities, nor does it control the decisions that RPC makes in regard to fulfilling the obligations stemming from the license agreement. RPC has control because all of RPC's personnel and are employees of RPC, not the city. Accordingly, only RPC controls its personnel's work and direction. RPC takes the responsibility starting from the time it recruits and screens its personnel. Consequently, RPC is the only entity that can determine if its personnel will engage in the activities outlined above or any event that RPC is solely responsible for coordinating. By way of illustration, RPC spends significant time and resources on horticultural care, free public programming, and a summer camp. NYC parks focus more on basic services, such as mowing the grass and picking up trash, maintaining infrastructure and hardscape, and providing security. The NYC parks commissioner might very well prefer for RPC to provide additional support for these basic park functions rather than what we actually do. Under no circumstances could the NYC Parks Commissioner or his agents direct RPC to redirect its personnel to provide additional support for those functions. In fact, RPC has significant discretion in the type of work it chooses to have its personnel engage in or not engage in with RPC Parks, such as providing athletic field maintenance at other fields throughout RP, uh, Riverside Park, assisting with tree pruning services or ongoing tree care, soliciting and receiving funding to support the cleaning, repair, or other conservation care of monuments and antiquities located within Riverside Park. So although we work side by side with a common goal, but different responsibilities, RPC Parks simply does not and cannot control RPC. Second, the RPC's president and CEO does not take di direction from any NYC Parks official. Rather, pursuant to RPC's bylaws, our president is responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the conservancy and reports to and serves under the direction of the board of trustees and the chair. <coughs> the bylaws further direct the property and affairs of RPC are managed by the board of directors and ensure that RPC's funds are not commingled with any of the city's funds. The bylaws prohibit any public official, including the Riverside Park Administrator, the NYC Parks Commissioner, or the mayor, from having a vote on and from being considered in the determination of a quorum, RPC's Board of Trustees. The president of the RPC does not have regular contact with the mayor, the NYC Parks Commissioner, or the Manhattan Borough Commissioner about any subject. Third, RPC regularly challenges RPC Parks and the mayor to deliver more resources to Riverside Park, and when NYC Parks has no control over what RPC communicates publicly. Under the leadership of our new president, Dan Gorodnik, RPC has been critical of the city's lack of investment in Riverside Park and has called for improvements. Whether or not RPC Parks Commissioner or the mayor want to hear it, RPC has autonomy over what it communicates publicly. The Conflict of Interest Board Rules Section 303, adopted pursuant to Administrative Code Section 3901, says it will evaluate the totality of circumstances in evaluating whether the mayor or the NYC Parks Commissioner exercises control over RPC. As noted above, while the mission of RPC is to support Riverside Park, we are a private cooperation with our own rules, bylaws, and government structure. We decide how to spend our own resources, and while we operate within a mutually agreed upon license agreement, we do not take direction from the City of New York. We also do not take direction from the Riverside Park Administrator, a public employee. The remaining circumstances in COIB's totality of circumstances tests are clearly in favor of RPC not being deemed controlled by an elected official. Furthermore, RPC was not created by the mayor or the NYC Parks Commissioner, is not chaired by the mayor or the NYC Parks Commissioner or any other city employee. Its board members are not appointed by the mayor or the NYC Parks Commissioner or any city employee. 
Board members served for fixed terms and cannot be removed by the mayor or parks commissioner or any other city employee. And the mayor and the NYC parks commissioner can give no direction on RPC's policies, operations, and activities. In sum, there's not a single indicator present here that would suggest that RPC is controlled by the mayor or the parks commissioner. The law should not be applied to us. But if COIB continues to do so, we respectfully submit that we should be explicitly carved out of this law. Your proposed amendments are helpful and appreciated, but not nearly enough to avoid the significant harm to organization and to Riverside Park. If the bill proceeds without carving us out, it's critical that you, one, increase the threshold to $25,000 to mitigate the extreme burden this law would have on us, delete the onerous provision requiring the donors disclose their spouse, domestic partner, unemancipated child, and or parent, and so they can be run through the doing business database, push back the effective date on Local Law 181 to January 1 of 2020 to allow us to ensure the necessary staffing to prepare for compliance, for the impose the liability for violations of any provision on Section 3902 exclusively on the elected official who allegedly controls our organization, and five, de define the terms agent and appointee so they can have some reasonable limits. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Am I on? Hi, good afternoon, Council, uh, City Council, Council Member Matteo, good to see you again, Council Member Grudenchik and Levine. Uh, I'm, yes, very well rested. Uh, so I'm Lynn Kelly, I'm the uh, Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks, the citywide advocacy organization for parks and open space. Uh, rather than read through my testimony, I'm both going to address some of the questions that were brought up by the council as a part of um, the earlier testimony, um, but suffice it to say that we're asking the council to completely reconsider the amendment uh, for Local Law 181 and fully exclude parks, conservancies, and public-private park partnership organizations. Um, in addition, uh, we ask that the um, significant that we significantly increase the threshold level um, should that still be as a part of it and I'll speak to that in a moment later of five thousand dollars and that the reporting and the review requirements set forth by the COIB be limited to the donor only um, we also think there needs to be clarification on the affiliated portion of the law as well so uh, I think Councilmember Grudenchik mentioned earlier the success of uh, Central Park Conservancy Prospect Park Alliance and others their records speak for themselves what I'd also like to point out is today we're represented by the City Parks Foundation as well. And uh, under the current law as it exists, they are also subject to Local Law 81. And I want to point out that there are many organizations like them that provide a significant level of programming and service to local parks throughout New York City that do not have large conservancies um, and that may lack the resources to financially support parks in their neighborhoods. Without the support of organizations like the Central <coughs> Park uh, Foundation, so pardon me, City Parks Foundation, many local park stewardship groups would not have access to the critical technical assistance that they need in their community. Um, Council members Levine and Grudenchik, you know very well that we sit in front of you year after year advocating for an increase to the city's budget for the Parks Department and have had limited success. Though that's going to change, right, Council member Grudenchik? Okay, very good. So, yes, pressure's on. Um, I will say that the reason that we fight for these funds is that often these organizations, including conservancies, um, do have volunteer-driven constituencies, and that the reporting requirements on these would also be an additional onerous tax. And for nascent and smaller conservancies that are operating these neighborhoods and have not benefited from private public partnerships of open space, asking their donors to provide what may consider many consider to be private information uh, may preclude potential supporters from making any future donations. Um, very simply put, I want to speak to some examples. Uh, we had mentioned the uh, cultural institutions groups or some of the cultural organizations. For six years prior to this job, I was the CEO of Snug Harbor Cultural Center and Botanical Garden, which is both a cultural organization and an 83-acre park. And I can tell you that for decades, there were several ex officio members um, on the board of directors. Two from the administration, the Department of Cultural, Appear uh, Cultural Affairs, Parks Department, um, as well as a representative from the borough president's office. At no time were there any issues <laughs> during any tenure of mine, certainly, any that I'm aware of. They did not vote. They did not participate financially in the organization. They were simply there to work with us and to provide guidance as needed, as frankly, 
we, Snug Harbor Cultural Center, were maintaining and controlling a very important city asset, much in the way the conservancies here provide for, fund, maintain, and control very important city assets. Um, I would also say that as a small organization or mid-size for a cultural organization and a park-led organization, any kind of reporting, even if the threshold was increased, would have been incredibly onerous for me and my team. And frankly, it would have been time that we would have been spent away from cleaning the park, programming the park, maintaining the park, going outside the park into other neighborhoods to provide services. Um, so from a personal basis, I say any kind of reporting in addition to that would be onerous. And I say that not for lack of transparency, because at organizationally we were required to report to the Department of Cultural Affairs on our donations, public, private donations, uh, institutional, foundation giving. There was no lack of transparency, but to add an additional reporting process would have been overly problematic, much as I see is happening here uh, with the conservancy organizations. Lastly, I would also say to the Conflict of Interest Board, and I thank you for already putting forward some solutions. I think that's a really great thing. But to classify the organizations that receive these letters um, as having registered but not objective, I don't think that's actually fair because there are many conservancies in this room that got the letter. They follow the rules. They registered, but they still object. So now we're faced with this conundrum on the reporting piece, which was very well identified by Councilmember Gredenchik and Levine. So a solution to that, knowing that, yes, these organizations are going to be spending time, resources, brain power, and sweat equity, frankly, in preparing to do the reporting, would be to put some kind of freeze on the reporting process now, immediately, while the law is being determined or whatever you figure out in terms of the amendment. But I can tell you it is time spent away of critical activity to be spending your time doing reporting for a law that perhaps wasn't intended for you. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Am I on? Am I not? Put it back on. Yeah. Now you're good. Well, I was good before that, but thank you. I'm Mark Aiken. I'm the president of Friends of Cunningham Park. We're a 501c3, and our mission is to maintain Cunningham Park as the premier park of Northeast Queens. Why this law applies to us, I have absolutely no idea in the whole world. If I get a donation of $50, I do my happy dance. <laughs> and I hear you talking about these big dollars. The preponderance of our funds comes from you, the city council, all $13,000, to do summer activities, concerts, shows, Shakespeare, and even that you curtailed by only permitting us to use 30% of the dollars that you give to us for vendors, whereas all of our money <laughs> goes for vendors. So we had to work out a way of, of keeping this money and it's not given to us. It's given to the Parks Department, who in turn says, what would you like us to do with this money? Nobody tells us to do anything. The mayor has never been to our park. City council people, assembly people, uh, Daddy Lewandowski, the uh, Queens Park Commissioner, has never told us what to do. Well, she did once, but she didn't after that because she and I had a little... She's a very strong woman, and I like to think I'm a pretty strong guy. I still don't understand why this onerous law applies to organizations such as mine. Notice I didn't bring three or four pieces of paper because I don't have three or four pages to say. All of my colleagues here have said those three or four pages that I would have put in, and the commission is certainly who I know from a long time ago, said it so well. And these two young ladies said it so well. This is not a good law. And whereas the city council did have the power to make the law, the city council has the power to change and amend the law. And I ask you to do so. Yeah, can we switch seats? Yep. You know what, let me get up since I'm closest. Oh, thank you so much. And I'll suck in my stomach. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Chair Mateo, Parks Chair Grodenchik, the members of the Committee on Standard and Ethics. I am Deborah Marr, Vice President and General Counsel of Randall's Island Park Alliance, a nonprofit that has been the dedicated steward of Randall's Island Park for over 25 years. The Alliance sustains, maintains, develops, and programs the park to support the well-being of all New Yorkers. Randall's Island Park offers 60 athletic fields, Icon Stadium, 20 tennis courts, a driving range, miles of pedestrian waterfront pathway, and more. The park attracts over 3 million visitors per year, many of whom are local families from East Harlem, the South Bronx, and Queens who participate in the Alliance free recreational program. The Alliance raises over 50% of the park's annual budget and employs approximately 100 staff members, including gardeners, maintenance workers, environmental educators, HR, finance, you name it. Over, our staff acts at the direction and reports to our board of trustees, not to, to New York City Parks. The essential work that the Alliance does would not be possible without the generosity of our donors and the leadership of our independent volunteer board. I am here today to respectfully request that you amend Local Law 181 to clarify that it should not apply to public-private park partners such as the Alliance and other park partnerships across the city. Park partners and supporters are an asset to the city of New York. They are a proven effective management structure that efficiently allows independent nonprofit organizations to partner with NYC Department of Parks and Recreation to better parks. The relationship between New York City parks and nonprofit park conservancies is a true public private partnership. It is premised on working together as two independent entities and not on control by a city agency. The Alliance, like many, operates in the park under a fully negotiated arm's length license agreement approved and consented to by the New York City Law Department. The agreement provides clear delineation of roles, accountability, and governance. Independent audits and those done by the City Comptroller's Office on contractual park partners, as well as IRS 990s, provide transparency. Randall's Island Park Alliance leadership is independent, founded by independent citizen, chair chaired throughout the history by independent citizens and governed always by an independent board of trustees. Our independence is critical to our ability to fundraise. Donors demand the accountability that comes from a 501c3 nonprofit and the knowledge that their dollars are being used for a specific mission. Thus, the negative impact of Local Law 181 classifying the Alliance as an organization affiliated with an elected official and controlled by the mayor through the parks commissioner cannot be overstated. Parks, partners, conservancies should not be politicized. They are not, nor should they be, depicted as an agent of the mayor simply because the parks commissioner sits ex officio on a board or that one or two parks employees also separately work with the alliance, fully approved and vetted by the conflict of interest board. Such characterization would jeopardize support by those who might feel their donation have been politicized or who may not be a supporter of a particular city hall administration or parks commissioner, whether past, current, or future. Our donors donate because they trust us, Randall's Island Park Alliance, and because they believe in open green space and world-class facilities and programming for all. Since the Alliance inception, we have raised approximately $80 million in private money. This year alone, we replaced three synthetic fields on which thousands of children play at a cost of $1.2 million. The project, as well as countless others, would not be possible without the Alliance. As we move forward and take on new projects, we must maintain trust with our donors and independence to be successful. Local Law 181 contains intrusive, burdensome reporting requirements that, among other things, call for the information regarding a donor's spouse and children and cross-referencing of donors and their family against the city's doing business database. This action would have a chilling effect on our ability to raise private dollars which provide critical funds to the park. The law also requires us to certify to which elected official we are affiliated, despite our protest that we are affiliated with none, notwithstanding the conflict of interest board staff's initial opine. This law was meant to regulate campaign finance, and yet because of the way it was drafted and then interpreted, park partners like ourselves have been unfairly caught up in a net that was never meant to apply to us. We now need your help to untangle us. 
we respectfully request that City Council amend Local Law 181 to carve out entities such as the Alliance. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I know uh, Councilmember Gredenchik would like to say a quick remark. I uh, just want to add uh, my comments to uh, Chair Matteo. I want to thank you all for being here today, and I want to thank you uh, for working with me and my staff and, and the council staff for uh, working on this legislation. And it's fairly obvious to me um, that you would like to see Parks Conservancies carved out. So <laughs> suffice to say. Um, so I thank you for being here today. Um, I really don't have any questions. I think they have all been answered. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. Haken, for thank you, your sense of you. You forgot to mention the $7.5 million we put in Birmingham Park. But <laughs> all right, that's all right, all right. Time. We're not thank talking you. about member allocations tonight. I forgot that. Thank you, thank you. Next panel is Eloise Hirsch, um, Maggie Greenfield, Heather Lubov, and Sue Donahue. Yep, you're ready. Thank you. Is it, is it on? Yes. And Council Member Levine, greetings, good to see you. My name is Susan Donahue, and I serve as both the Administrator of Prospect Park and the President of the Prospect Park Alliance. It's my pleasure to submit this testimony today. I also want to thank the Conflicts of Interest Board for being here and for your willingness to listen and maybe think about reinterpreting um, some of what we're talking about. As you may know, the Prospect Park Alliance is a not-for-profit that partners with the New York City Parks Department and the community to foster stewardship of Prospect Park. Established in 1987, the Alliance helps to care for the natural environment, preserve the park's historic design, provide facilities, oversee more than 25,000 permanent events each year, mainly consisting of birthday parties and family events and picnics, and host programs and activities throughout the year for all New Yorkers. Over the past 31 years, the Prospect Park Alliance has played a pivotal role in restoring the park to its original glory. During this time, we've worked closely with local elected officials, the Parks Department, and the surrounding communities to identify, prioritize, design, and complete approximately 50 restoration projects over close to 120 acres of Prospect Park and 5,100 linear feet of our water course, totaling over $200 million of capital investment. We now estimate that the park receives some 10 million visits each year, and thousands of people each year are engaged in our free educational and volunteer programs offered by the Alliance. Today, I join my colleagues from across the city to speak on Local Law 181 and the proposed amendment to the law. Councilmember Kalos, one of the co-sponsors of Local Law 181, describes this law as closing the campaign for one New York loophole by limiting contributions to, not to nonprofits controlled by elected officials and disclosing donors. Our collective understanding is that Local Law 181 was passed to prevent campaign finance violations and to specifically monitor organizations that are controlled by elected officials. The Prospect Park Alliance is not controlled by any elected official. Our board of directors is structured such that the mayor appoints two directors, the Brooklyn Borough President serves as a voting ex officio director and appoints two directors, our council, our local council person, currently council member Lander, who was here earlier, serves as a voting ex officio director, and the parks commissioner also serves as a voting ex officio director. I myself also serve as a voting ex officio director, and I should point out I'm an employee of the Prospect Park Alliance, not of the City of New York. In addition to these eight directors, our bylaws allow for up to 40 independent volunteer directors, and the board currently has 37 of these 40 positions filled with independent individuals. While we work closely with our government partners, they are in no terms in control of the Prospect Park Alliance. 
our staff, and our community committee work in tandem with our board of directors to determine our priorities and guide our work to make Prospect Park one of the best parks in New York City. The small number of elected officials serving on our board of directors controls no aspect of this process or our organization. For the Prospect Park Alliance, the issue of control is paramount. As a nonprofit organization, we have for 30 years served an ex as an example of a successful, high-functioning public-private partnership. From our founding, we have operated as a hyper-local organization, inspiring stewardship from our neighbors and community members around the park who care, thankfully, about parks and open space for all. Our independence from government control has been a crucial factor in our ability to privately fundraise. We have no doubt that many of our donors would choose to direct their giving to another worthwhile organization if it would determine that we were controlled by elected officials. In determining control, Law 181 states that Conflicts of Interest Board must carefully consider the totality of the circumstances of each of our organizations. Was the, org was the organization created by an elected official? No. Is our board chaired by an elected official or their agent? No. Are board members appointed by an elected official? Only five out of 45. What's the degree of involvement by an elected official in our policies, operations, and activities? None to extremely limited. As stated, we work in close partnership and work together to build consensus on parks and open space issues with our elected officials and are thankful for that partnership but we operate independently from the city. We assume that based on one or more of these factors, the Conflict of Interest Board has made the determination that the Prospect Park Alliance is an organization affiliated with an elected official. The proposed amendment to Local Law 181 does nothing to change this determination by the Conflicts of Interest Board. We join our colleagues from across the city in asking that this definition of an organization affiliated with an elected official in 3-901 of the local 181, local law 181 be clarified. Prospect Park Alliance and the City of New York have enjoyed an extraordinarily fruitful partnership over three decades, and we look forward to continuing this relationship for decades to come. However, we encourage you, the City Council, to take the testimonies that you hear today under serious consideration and provide an amendment that will prevent our organizations from being abandoned by our donors. We work tirelessly to raise private dollars to supplement the City's efforts in maintaining and providing green space for the benefit of all New Yorkers. This law is a serious threat to our abilities to do that, and we hope that you will work with us today to correct it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you for the City Council's continued support. Good afternoon, Chairman Matteo, Councilmember Levine. Um, I'm Heather Lubov, Executive Director of the City Parks Foundation. We are not a conservancy, but we are a nonprofit organization that reaches 300,000 New Yorkers every year through free programs in public parks that create vibrant and healthy communities. I think we all agree that Local Law 181 was enacted to prevent candidates from sidestepping contribution and expenditure limits, but because of COIB's interpretation, this law will have the unintended consequence of chilling a very successful and long-standing public-private partnership between CPF and the Parks Department. As you've heard, COIB has notified us that we are affiliated with an elected official and are therefore subject to the law's restrictions on private fundraising and the burdensome invasive reporting requirements. Being branded as affiliated indicates that the city believes that the Parks Commissioner has substantial control over our operations and our decision making. We urge the council to correct this broad interpretation. You've heard that COIB must consider the totality of the criteria. We do not meet those criteria. Our board is independent and the Parks Commissioner serves ex officio with no vote. However, when COIB implemented 181, it created an additional criteria through its rulemaking. That is the degree to which public servants perform duties on behalf of the organization. We work closely with Parks Department staff, a collaboration that is central to our public-private partnership, and a testament to the willingness of the Parks Department to creatively improve parks. The Council has even given this successful partnership its imprimatur through the Parks Equity Initiative. But since 181 lacks clear criteria, 
COIB has branded us affiliated, essentially an agent of the mayor because of this collaboration. In the case of City Parks Foundation, COIB has also considered an additional criteria, which is that we provide limited fiscal sponsorship for the Parks Department. By managing funds that the Parks Department raises and filing the existing COIB required disclosure information, we are ensuring that donors who wish to support the agency's work can do so. There is absolutely no reason that providing fiscal sponsorship to the Parks Department would give it any control over our operations. We will be forced to discontinue this service if it is the cause of our affiliation, placing $3 million in Parks support in jeopardy. Allowing COIB to continue enforcing 181 in this broad manner will have a detrimental impact on our work and a chilling effect on our ability to raise the $15 million that we spend to activate and program parks. Often our donors support our work precisely because we are private and are not the city government. Complying with the law's requirement that we proactively indicate to donors that we are considered affiliated and as such are required to check the names during the Doing Business database would immediately turn away those supporters. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and thank you for your support of CPF. Thank you. <coughs> Is it on? Oh, you could drop it a little bit, the mic. Okay, thanks. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, Chair Matteo and Councilman Levine uh, and, and other members of the committee. Um, I'm Eloise Hirsch. I'm the president of the Fresh Kills Park Alliance. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on Local Law 181. I don't usually have a bass voice. Um, Fresh Kills Park Alliance is the not-for-profit that was organized in 2010 to support the development of Fresh Kills Park. As many of you know, Fresh Kills Park is the 2,200 acre former landfill that is now being transformed into the world's largest landfill to park project. This is a complex <coughs> interagency project that represents extraordinary engineering and stewardship by the Department of Sanitation and Parks working together. The mission of the Fresh Kills Park Alliance is to foster the creation and the stewardship of this incredible resource. With this mission, the Fresh Kills Park Alliance is just one of the numerous park organizations all over the city who are dedicated to championing, thank you, <coughs> a grow, uh, dedicated to championing our parks. In particular, we're among a group of smaller scale partners who work very hard raising money to support our work, often with tiny or even non-existent staffs, Compared to some of the larger conservancies, you may not hear very much about our outer borough partners in Queens and Staten Island and the Bronx, as well as outer regions of Brooklyn and Manhattan, who are supporting a whole range of initiatives. But our efforts would simply not happen without private support. So I'm testifying today in support of all my colleagues as we ask you to amend Local Law 181 to clarify that it should not apply to park partners such as ourselves. The Board of Directors of the Fresh Kills Park Alliance is completely independent of the City of New York. It's dedicated to supporting the creation and stewardship of Fresh Kills Park. Our volunteer board should not be characterized as agents of the mayor simply because they are working to enhance a public good that is supported by the city. While we understand the good intent of the law, law was campaign finance report, our inclusion within it implies that we have some sort of political role. However, both our dedicated board of directors and the donors who support, who support us know and rely on the fact that we're independent. Further, Local Law 181 includes a series of reporting requirements which add an astonishing burden of paperwork. We've all already talked about that. <coughs> In addition, the onerous requirement of information concerning a donor's spouse or a domestic partner and children will have a strongly chilling effect. And I'm sure that each of you give donations to organizations that you care most about, I'd, I'd ask you to ask yourself how you'd respond should those organizations inform you they will only accept your contribution if you tell them where your spouse works or who your children are. This issue of is of crucial concern to Fresh Coast Park Alliance as we operate completely through grants and donations. We could not do what we do without the generosity of Staten Islanders and people all over the city alongside the generosity and guidance of our board of directors. We're working very hard to make improvements and build support, but change takes time. In fact, for except for three projects at the edges of the site, Fresh Kills is still closed to the public. 
with the exception of the substantial array of programs supported by the Alliance. Through agreements and rules that allow safe public access, the Alliance supports STEM education programs for middle to high schoolers, scientific research projects in cooperation with regional universities, a series of public art exhibits and performances, public information tours, birding tours with the Audubon Society, road and bicycle events, and our very popular twice a year big open house where we open 800 acres. Remember Central Park was 804, 800 acres of the site for a full day of outdoor activities. Thousands of people have attended. The Alliance pays for the free bikes that people can borrow and visits by the Staten Island Philharmonic. All the kinds of activities that you would imagine happen in a big, huge, wide open space. The goal of all these activities sponsored by the Alliance is to make the park real to the public and build local support. We seek to alter the perception of what was once the worst blight on Staten Island a cause that so many fought for for so long, and to change that form of perception to reveal the enormous and exciting potential for the development of this great civic asset. It's difficult to raise funds for a park that is not open, but our board of directors and Parks Loyal fans are dedicated to supporting these programs. With the help of the City Council amending this law, Fresh Coast Park Alliance and our supporters will steward the park into a better future. I join my colleagues in, respect, in respectfully requesting that you amend local law 181 so that the city's diverse and committed par partner organizations like the Alliance are not included in this law. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Good afternoon, Chair Mateo and Parks Chair Gordinchik. I'm Maggie Greenfield. I have a dual title. I am serve both as the Bronx River Administrator for New York City Parks and also as Executive Director of the Bronx River Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization working in partnership with local communities, businesses, and really all levels of government to protect, improve, and restore the Bronx River so that it can be a resource for the communities through which it flows. I'm here today, of course, in response to Local Law 181, which was passed to prevent camp campaign finance violations and echo the concerns of my colleagues that it's gonna have the, these unintended consequences of hampering our successful um, public-private partnerships. We're a small organization. Um, we only have about a $1.5 million operating budget, but we've raised over $220 million for capital improvements, for um, environmental restoration and waterfront park developments. But equally importantly, we've really worked to transform the way that New Yorkers view the Bronx River from an abandoned dumping ground into a cherished community resource. Um, through our partnerships with New York City Parks, we've created 20 new acres of waterfront parkland. We've built seven canoe and kayak launches. We've engaged 16,000 volunteers and uh, three, over 3,000 educators and 16,000 students to use the river as an outdoor classroom. And we brought out over 20,000 New Yorkers on paddling adventures on New York City's only freshwater river. So not only does Local Law 181 and its amendments subject us to burdensome and invasive reporting requirements, but much more importantly, the Alliance and, and my colleagues have been defined as being affiliated with an elected official, a label that suggests that the mayor has substantial control over our operations and our decision making. This really calls into question the independence of our organizations and therefore would have that chilling effect we've all been referring to in our ability to raise private funds. Uh, I echo the concerns of my colleagues and, and call for the council to clarify the definition of an affiliated nonprofit. In determining substantial control, Law, Local Law 181 states that the Conflict of Interest Board should carefully consider the totality of the circumstances of each of our organizations. In the case of the Bronx River Alliance, we are not <coughs> controlled or we were not created by an elected official. We were formed by local community activists working to reclaim the river as a resource? Is our board chaired by an elected official or agent? Are board members appointed by an elected official? And can these board members be removed by an elected official? In our case, the answer is no to each of these questions. We have an independent board of directors who are all private citizens. The parks commissioner and local council members whose district touched the river are ex officio directors, but they actually have no vote on our board. Um, what's the degree of involvement by an elected official in our policies, operations, and activities? 
Well, the Parks Commissioner and the Council members have no vote on, vote on the board, so they are therefore una unable to influence policy. And to what degree do, thank you, please, do public servants acting under the authority or direction of elected official or agent of the elected official perform duties on behalf of the organization as part of their official city employment? While I am a city employee and there are other city parks employees on our staff, about five out of a staff of 20, the Alliance reimburses New York City for half of my salary. That represents our shared responsibility to restore the river. But the Board of Directors of the Alliance has the authority to determine policy and the overall direction of the Bronx River Alliance. At times, this has resulted in the Alliance taking p positions that are contrary to those of the city, which really demonstrates that this relationship with the city does not prevent the Alliance from taking independent stances. What's the purpose of the Bronx River Alliance? Our mission is to protect, improve, and restore the Bronx River corridor so they can be a healthy resource for the communities through which it flows. There's no reading of this mission that would include promotion of elected officials. We do, however, work closely with the Parks Department on capital projects, our programs, and day-to-day -day operations. That's the nature of a public-private partnership. Because the law lacks a clear criteria for an affiliated organization that really examines each circumstance closely, we have been determined to be controlled by the mayor, and that's just not the case. We therefore ask the council to include language. Well, first of all, we really I'm pleased to hear the direction of the conversation today to do this carve out for um, unrestricted organizations like ourselves. Um, so I think I'll just leave that as that, actually. Um, but we do b just want to really um, echo what my colleagues have said, that being listed as an affiliated organization would have a chilling effect on our ability to raise private dollars that help supplement the city's efforts to support, develop, and program our public parks. Um, as many here have said today, many donors give because they, they see us as independent entities, um, and so being affiliated with an elected official would be um, detrimental to our fundraising. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today here, and thank you for your support um, of our parks and of the Bronx River. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your work throughout the city. It's much appreciated, and uh, I know my colleague Mark Levine wants to say a few words. Thank you, Chair Matteo. We've now heard from, I think, um, eight different conservancies between the two panels. All five boroughs have been represented. We've had some very small nonprofits and some of the larger conservancies, and you've all spoken very powerfully in your own words in different ways, but a few themes have come through. Um, clearly, the burden on all of you from this kind of legislation uh, would be significant. Clearly, none of you are engaged in any of the political activities that are targeted by this legislation. And one point which I don't think we brought up as much as we should have in our questioning of, of Coy was the fact that this also would impact the donors themselves, who understandably didn't think they were signing up for disclosing um, things about their family and other matters that they'd like, like to keep uh, private. And as, as Commissioner Benepe uh, noted, I'm not sure if he's still here, but uh, there he is tweeting, as always. Uh, <laughs> as Commissioner Benepe noted, that's, there's nothing necessarily nefarious about wanting to be an anonymous donor. In fact, um, since it's Hanukkah and the Jewish faith, anonymous charity is considered a higher form of charity because it's not about you. So there could be lots of good reasons for someone wanting to be anonymous. Um, and if you eliminate that as an option, you're probably going to lose some donors. Uh, again, there's no um, public interest in understanding political forces at play here. Um, those interests would trump anonymity in other contexts, um, Citizens United related entities, et cetera. But that is nothing at all to do with parks and services. So I'm just validating your message. And thank you for speaking out, and of course, thank you for the work you're doing for our wonderful green spaces every, every single day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna, we have two more panels. <laughs> We're going to call up Susan Lerner and Alex Camarda.
you guys can start when you're ready. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Chair Matteo and members of the Standards and Ethics Committee. My name is Alex Camarda. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for reInvent Albany. reInvent Albany is a government watchdog organization which advocates for open and accountable government. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. I, I do want to say before I summarize my testimony, I think there is uh, a degree of confusion and even misinformation about um, Local Law 181 of 2016, at least as far as uh, our interpretation goes. It seems like many of the conservancies that have come before you today are, are pointing to the rules that were promulgated by COIB in relation to that legislation. Uh, they are on the bottom of page three of our testimony. And there's a number of factors that COIB applies to determine if a nonprofit is indeed affiliated with an elected official. We think those are reasonable factors, but it seems that many of the conservancies that have come before you today are really disagreeing with the application of the rules. And so I think maybe those uh, issues can be resolved just through communications between COIB and the nonprofits or maybe clarifying what the totality of the circumstances means for these particular set of factors. But I don't think that necessarily means that the, lo the law itself is flawed or that we need to change it. Uh, the other thing I would point out is that many of these conservancies and in fact many government affiliated nonprofits already have their donors disclosed in broad ranges that are on the Conflicts of Interest Board's website. And so what Local Law 181 does is actually provide specific information as to who the donors are and the particular amount of money they've given. But that information is already available in ranges in a, in a hundreds of pages PDF on COIB's website. So, and I think as, as um, New Yorkers for Parks uh, indicated, they're providing some of this information already to the agencies, which I then believe are disclosing it to COIB. So the mechanism is in place. Some of, some of these things may need to be uh, refined or worked through, but I don't think under any circumstance that donations that are now being reported, uh, at least in ranges, should not be reported. We would certainly oppose that. So let me just um, go back and talk generally about why reInvent Albany has focused on this, uh, meaning government affiliated nonprofits, as an area that we think needs to be um, more scrutinized by the city council, more regulated generally, even beyond uh, local law 181. So uh, we do this work not only in New York City, but uh, in New York State, and we also are connected to many groups across the country in the open government community. And I can tell you that the growth of nonprofits uh, linked or affiliated with governments is a tremendous issue across the country and has been a source of corruption, including in New York State. Some of you may have heard of Fort Schuyler Management. Fort Schuyler Management is a nonprofit affiliated with SUNY and it was the entity that uh, bidded out the Buffalo Billion Project that was the subject of a corruption trial earlier this year and the conviction of Governor Cuomo's, um, some of his senior officials. Um, that project was bid out uh, by an entity that did not follow the open meetings law, did not at the time follow the freedom of information law, and part of the reason we believe that bid was rigged was it wasn't subject to, uh, uh, to public scrutiny, and it was also not subject to agency procurement rules that were followed by state agencies, namely the comptroller's review of that contract before it was executed. And these are problems, unfortunately, that we see uh, not only in New York State, but across the country. Uh, I was in over Thanksgiving in Philadelphia where they arrested the uh, mayor's appointee to the mayor's fund in Philadelphia for criminally using um, the nonprofit's funds for personal use. And there are many examples like that uh, across the country. Uh, we also see with many economic development entities, uh, they don't disclose their funding. They're the subject of litigation around freedom of information and open meetings law. If you talk to any open government group uh, in states across the country, they'll tell you that this is an ongoing issue. And that's why we've really recommended uh, increased regulation and some of this we think is very basic, um, starting with just providing a listing for the city of all its affiliated nonprofits and which agencies they're affiliated with. I think the council would find it hard to actually identify that list. We believe there's over 100, maybe as many 200 city affiliated nonprofits, 
Um, but as you heard today, because the definitions are, are not clear, clear uh, and the only existing definition I actually know of is in the COIB rules, we don't actually know how many city-affiliated nonprofits there really are. Uh, as I indicated, many nonprofits are, are not clear about whether they follow FOIL or the open meetings law. Some do who are affiliated with government, and some claim they do not have to. Um, when it comes to spending, there are city-affiliated nonprofits like the Economic Development Corporation that does not provide its spending information to Checkbook NYC and the Comptroller's Office, so you're unable to see how they're actually spending their money, which is something, obviously, taxpayers would expect of a city agency ca carrying out a similar purpose. Um, as far as the ethics requirements go, we would like to see um, limitations on donations by those doing business with the city to city-affiliated nonprofits, regardless of whether they're affiliated with an elected official or not. We don't think the limit would have to be $400, as it is for those that are affiliated with elected officials. We think it could be some number uh, potentially much higher than that, but we think at the very least the donor should be disclosed and if the companies or individuals are doing business with the city and they're giving money to a nonprofit, that that should be restricted. Uh, I will say that we have only looked very, very closely at one nonprofit, which is the Fund for Public Schools. I, I, I will say that reInvent Albany is not focused on the, um, the parks nonprofits. Uh, but when looking at the Fund for Public Schools, we looked at their top 30 donors. Nine of them were doing business with the city. And when I say doing business with the city, I mean they had millions of dollars in contracts and had given hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars to that nonprofit. And several of them had no interest whatsoever in education uh, based on the missions of their organizations. They had pending contracts or issues before city officials at the time they gave their contributions. Uh, and so that's the kind of nexus that we're concerned about. Thank you, and I'll close there. Thank you. I'm Susan Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of Common Cause New York. Um, and I have very uh, short written testimony, but there's some issues that have come up today that I do want to talk about. We generally are supportive of the um, purpose behind the original bill. We do agree that the interpretation has created some onerous requirements, and we think that the disclosure requirements should not be abolished. They should be significantly simplified. But part of the problem is that um, the city hasn't really done as much as it needs to do in terms of requiring disclosures from the target of the original uh, legislation, which are elected and appointed officials. Other uh, jurisdictions, California and within California, San Diego and San Francisco are the ones I'm familiar with, require that the elected official who solicits for a particular charity, whether it's affiliated or unaffiliated, has to make a disclosure for any contribution they solicit above $5,000. It could be to the Diabetes Society, it could be to the Red Cross, uh, it could be to a Parks Conservancy. Uh, and that gets, I think, even more directly into the issue which was created by the campaign for One New York. But sitting and listening to the testimony today, um, uh, reinforces for me a concern that we at Common Cause have had as part of our NY Commons project, and that is who is controlling public lands, which the city, which the public invests in and counts on, and are we creating a system where valuable public assets, which millions of people, has been pointed out, use, actually have no influence over? When you have a city government which controls public assets, there's at least a check at the ballot box. I understand the financial pressures, but we seem to have gone from one extreme to the other, where there is only the government involved to a situation where the government actually is more than happy to hand over control over important assets and determine how they will be used without the input of people who frankly don't have the money to sit on the board. And we have countless instances 
of public-private partnerships in conflict with their surrounding communities about how the public assets which they control are going to be handled. And the one that comes to mind most readily is several years old, but that has to do with a uh, debate between the Randalls Park Island Conservancy and the East Harlem communities, where the uh, people, the uh, entity that controls Randall's Island wanted to restrict the use of the playing fields during certain hours to only entities which contributed and the community objected. It was quite a fight because there's no accountability on the board. There's no transparency on the boards. So that may not be an issue which necessarily this committee should be taking up, but I agree totally with Alex and reInvent Albany that we need to have a more general conversation to get the balance right so that there is more accountability and transparency um, for these entities which are controlling extremely valuable public assets and in some instances deciding to give away or trade away control, public ownership of those assets without a lot of oversight. So that's an issue which I hope when we're talking about land use in general we'll be able to address perhaps through the Charter Revision Commission or through another commission. Um, but today, I do believe that um, the impetus behind the amendment is the proper one in getting the balance right to be sure that the disclosures are not horribly onerous uh, and that they are meaningful to the public is something which I think we should be addressing. I think that the amendment is, um, uh, it perhaps requires too many details. I'm open to the idea of withdrawing the family disclosures, although as somebody who does the research, trying to figure out who the donors are and what their motivations beyond altruism, because often, let's be honest, it's not just altruism, um, is often very challenging. The, the primary onus should be on the elected officials, not on the organizations. Um, for many of the things that Common Cause um, advocates should be disclosed. We ourselves have to disclose. The New York office right now is two people, so I'm doing all the disclosures. I understand how onerous they can be. So let's get the balance right and let's think through what do people need to know. Um, and I would point out that while we were here, I pulled up the annual report for the Parks Conservancy to see how much of a problem anonymous donations are. And for the hundreds, what seemed to be hundreds of people listed on the annual report in categories of giving, there were 12 uh, anonymous donations that were uh, anonymous donors that were listed. So there is a balance. I think it's very helpful uh, to consult uh, with the conservancies and get that balance right, but we're not ready to jump to the idea that the conservancies should be entirely exempted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. Uh, Councilmember Levine. Um, thank you, Chair Mattia. Well, um, it's, it's great to see both of you. Uh, Susan, if you go along with us on this, maybe we'll exempt the good government groups from the recovery. <laughs> I would to never save ask you that. and your staff for time. <laughs> I, I, I agree with most of what both of you said. I, I wholeheartedly agree with the concerns about the rise of these um, deeply uh, affiliated nonprofits like the Fund for Public Schools. Um, and I, I'm always guided by two concerns. Are people giving to them to curry favor with the mayor or the relevant public official? And are these entities essentially operating in the political arena, maybe provo promoting an elected official, et cetera? Um, those are the two concerns that um, motivated us to act legislatively on the Campaign for One New York, and, and clearly there are other entities which um, because one of one or both of those, because of one or both of those concerns, we also need um, to ensure disclosure of. And I'm not looking to weaken personally disclosure on any of those kinds of entities. Um, I I said before, and I repeat that I don't think that Parks Conservancies, um, under any conceivable, common sense, rational analysis. Um, should be a concern on, under either of those two counts. Um, and I, I, I did think I heard Alex agree with that. You can clarify in a second whether that was accurate. Um, and Susan, I, I heard you not agree with that. I will say that you, 
you um, spent some time expressing concerns about use of public space. Um, that could be a topic for another hearing. It's actually been the topic of many hearings. I will say for the record that um, while there could be some questions on the margin about access to ball fields, et cetera, uh, I really do want to endorse um, the incredible benefit that conservancies have provided to the city that have turned around um, public green spaces that were in terrible shape due to decades of neglect. And there's just no question that on balance, they are a great thing for the city and for these green spaces. Um, and at any rate, I don't think that um, donor disclosure has anything to do with uh, the, the, the um, questions about restrictions of access to public space, which don't even apply with a lot of these conservancies, and at any rate, are not central to this. This is, again, about influencing the mayor or political activity. Um, l let me just, I'll, I'll give you a chance to respond in a second. So I just don't think that's even on the table regarding the legislation we're talking about. Um, to me, the question is whether th there, there's an adequate way to carve out parks and conservancies without also losing oversight over the fund for, city pub pub fund for the public schools type entities. And I would be interested in giving, getting you know, your smart thinking on that. I mean, Susan, you might not even endorse that goal, but to the extent that, Alex, you do, whether um, we can do that, um, get the conservancies out from under this while aggressively going after the entities that really do need to be um, under more oversight. So I, I would like to say that perhaps it is not within the, the jurisdiction of this committee, although I think I could argue that it is, that there really needs to be a third concern, Council Member Levine, and that is that there may be uh, individuals and entities who are motivated not by political purposes, but by real business purposes. Yes. Um, Absolutely. And that, 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 is, that we have, in an essence, backdoored into but, that. But that doesn't apply to parks and services. Yeah. It really doesn't. Well, I, I, w I think there are some community activists who could pretty well argue uh, some instances where it seems that it does. But you know, Can you even give me a, an example? Well, I would say that... Uh, there's, a there's been a great deal of controversy around allowing private developers to take over and control parts of the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, I'm going to pass this off to, to, to Chair Grudenchik, but uh, I'd, I'd have to unpack what you're talking about there. I would be shocked if people uh, think they're getting political favor, a lot of giving to a conservancy. Many of them are directly at odds with the mayor, and many of their board members uh, don't... Uh, are not on the political are not politically aligned with the mayor, and, and others are simply entirely independent, and the mayor is probably unaware of who gives uh, uh, or anything about the operations of these entities. Well, there were actually other political uh, in p political politi politicians who took strong positions in favor or against giving away part of the Brooklyn Bridge Park to condominium development. So, I mean, politics always enters into it in some way, shape, or form um, because of the way in which land use is done here. Um, so in that regard, what I'd like to see are the disclosures streamlined and made as simple and clear as possible and that all disclosures on the COIB website for these sorts of information has to be machine readable and not in PDFs. Because if you're not, if the if the government entities are not going to do the correlations the way the state is trying to do correlation with the Attorney General's um, Sunlight website of correlating who gives and who's getting contracts and who has access to real estate, then at least the information provided to the public has to be easy to deal with uh, and not just an endless series of thousands of PDFs that we have to scrape down one by one by one. Yeah, I would echo that comment. I mean, the part of this bill that we really support and have called for, which is in our recommendations, is just the open data nature of the already, the disclosures that are already there and the subsequent ones to come. I mean, I've actually gone, done the painstaking task of going through the, uh, those PDFs, at least for the Fund for Public Schools, and it's very difficult to actually extract who the donors are because they're filed in six-month periods and do that over a course of years and then 
compare that to the doing business database and see which one have interest before the city. So all that should be made easier. That's the part of this bill that we support the most. Um, to, to your question regarding uh, the parks nonprofits, you know, I, I would say this. Those weren't the nonprofits we were thinking of when we have heard about these issues with nonprofits at the state level, across the country. Many of them are economic development entities. That's how the uh, issue first came to us. And I would say that um, the concerns raised today, I thought were really about the rule that the COI promulgated and whether these nonprofits should be considered affiliated or not. So I think that would be the starting point under the, the rule that's there, which we think is reasonable in terms of the factors that COI has laid out, whether those factors apply to specific uh, nonprofits that seem to say today that they're independent and in fact they're not. Uh, you know, they're not meeting that criteria. I don't know who's right, because I don't know their organizations, and I don't know how COIB's applying it, but I think that's the starting point. Right, but again, common sense helps us understand the situation. The conservancies are not controlled by the mayor, or they're not controlled. They are really uh, as independent as nonprofits can be, and uh, maybe, we need, maybe we need to examine the, the standards that COIB set out, but my question is whether there's a legislative fix here that since you seem to endorse carving out parks nonprofits, is there a legislative solution? What I'm saying is I don't think, I mean, I know now from having looked at the COIB's website that contributions by many of these conservancies are disclosed. They're disclosed in ranges that are pretty broad, and it seems that they're disclosed by the city agency they're affiliated with rather than the nonprofit. I wouldn't want to see any... Uh, anything less than what's currently being done. We really want to put the onus on the agencies, much more than the private entities, to be sure that the disclosures are correct and usable <laughs> by the public. And I don't want to create the impression that somehow or other common causes against conservancies or public-private partnerships, but we've got to get the balance right. Thank you, Ms. Lerner and Mr. Camarda, uh, for being here today. Um, I just want to state for the record a couple of things, just uh, in response to what you uh, testified. No parkland has been given away. Um, as you know, as you probably know, um, it would take an act of the state legislature with the governor's signature to do that. I do share your concerns, and we recently held a hearing about joint operated playgrounds, especially with regard to Marx Brothers playgrounds, but there are over 200, I think 65, depending on how you count, um, joint operated playgrounds, and it's one thing if we build a New York City public school on them, it's another thing if we're building, you know, the tallest tower between 96th Street and Boston. So that's a big difference in my viewpoint, and I think most of my colleagues and most people would share that. Um, I am very concerned as the parks chair um, and as a New Yorker, um, about the damage that might be done to conservancies. Um, as you heard the testimony from the COIB, my colleagues um, from the conservancies themselves, there has never been, thankfully, a hint of scandal uh, in any way, shape, or form um, regarding hundreds and hundreds of millions, and I think um, it's probably in excess of a billion dollars that has been raised by these organizations. We do remember what our major parks look like before <coughs> conservancies, and I, for one, uh, do not want to revisit that in my lifetime or, or beyond my lifetime. And I agree with you that we need to take necessary and prudent steps, but I also think um, in balance that um, the conservancies are being punished for something that they haven't done. So we have to find the bad actors. There certainly are. <laughs> Uh, without pointing fingers, but not in New York City parks. Um, and we work very closely with Commissioner Silver, who's done an excellent job uh, with his borough commissions and all those things. And I have visited, I think, in, I'm closing in on 100 parks now in two-thirds of the district, and many of them are operated by conservancies. And um, just they're doing a wonderful job. So that has to be kept also, in my mind, at least at the forefront. Um, obviously... Um, we want to be as transparent as possible, but I think that there are things in place already. Um, and, and you heard that the Conflict of Interest Board testified today that they would support a carve-out uh, in this case. I'm also available to you if you'd like to meet with me. I've met with dozens and dozens and dozens of groups, some of them 
a dozen times um, with regard to our parks. And uh, um, just to put it in balance, you know, the parks budget, um, which Ms. Kelly testified about before, um, is slightly over half a billion dollars a year. So if you do the math, there is a very substantial portion of funding that comes into our New York City parks, which are open for everybody to enjoy. Um, Central Park being the world famous park, but um, at least 17 of them are raising a million dollars a year, which would otherwise not come into our park system. So I'm all for f in favor of striking a balance, um, and I appreciate very, very much uh, your testimony. I look forward to meeting with you uh, about this privately. Call my office, and I don't run my life, so if you want to meet with me, <laughs> please call my office, and they'll set that up. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's good to know. Councilmember uh, thank you both for your testimony. One, our last panel, certainly, uh, last but certainly not least, Katie Horowitz, Hope Cohen, Pamela Pettyjohn, and Christina Taylor. Go ahead, you could start. Great, thank you. Am I on? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Mateo, uh, Chair Gradenchik, and um, and everyone here today. Uh, I'm uh, <laughs> and and you. Thank you. Um, I'm Katie Denny Horowitz, and I'm the Director of External Affairs at Socrates Sculpture Park, uh, located in Long Island City, Queens. I want to thank everyone for allowing me to come and speak today. Um, like many other park conservancies here today, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we maintain a lease agreement with the City of New York, with the Parks Department. Um, and unlike many other parks conservancies here today, uh, we are primarily a visual arts organization. Um, Socrates uh, is considered a cultural anchor in Queens. We serve over 200,000 people a year. Uh, Socrates was a... Um, uh, a landfill site, about five acres on the waterfront of Long Island City, until 1986, uh, shortly after the Central Park Conservancy was created. Um, an artist named Mark DeSuvro and community, member, community members in Long Island City, Queens, came to clean up the five-acre site and make it into a public park uh, for use of the community. Uh, the Commissioner Silver does sit ex officio on our board. Um, uh, 15 of whom um, are artists, architects, local business members. Um, I'd like to point out that half of our board is uh, living or working in our community. Um, we became a 501c3 in 1992. Our first exhibition opened earlier than that in 1986, and we became official parkland in 1993. Uh, we're open every day from 9 a.m. to dusk, and in the last 30 years, we've uh, commissioned over 1,200 artists. Uh, we presented over 80 um, exhibitions, and we serve about 8,000 teenagers and children a year in our arts education programming. On top of that, we do site-specific dance. Uh, we have a popular international cinema festival. We present opera, uh, Shakespeare. Uh, we do kayaking. We do yoga. Uh, and uh, we have a green market and have a healthy living program. Um, as a tax-exempt organization, uh, we raise approximately $1.4 million a year. 100% uh, of that uh, supports the maintenance administration and programming of the waterfront park. Um, and 100% of our funding um, is raised privately uh, by Socrates. Every program at Socrates is free of charge. And more than 80% of our income comes from private individuals, foundations, and businesses who share our core value that access to green space, the waterfront, and the arts should be open to all. Our elected officials um, are also supportive of this, and uh, this current fiscal year we received uh, $10,000 um, from our local council members and borough president, uh, which makes up 0.07% uh, of our annual budget. Uh, as we close out our fiscal year, I'm pleased to report that we raised nearly $300,000 from more than 100 individuals with an average contribution of $200,000. Uh, <laughs> of $2,000. <laughs> Um, for a nonprofit, 
uh, uh, organization like ours cultivating, um, identifying, and managing indivi individual donors is a significant aspect, um, especially uh, a nonprofit that develops and delivers exclusively free programming. Uh, should a modest organization like Socrates Sculpture Park be required to comply with the stipulations we've all talked about today? Um, I agree with my parks colleagues uh, from earlier that such requirements could put much of this critical support at risk. It would place an undue, if not nearly impossible, burden on an already overcapacity staff. We have a staff of six people. Um, and it would confuse or worse jeopardize our donor relationships by introducing new demands on our individual contributors. Socrates wholeheartedly supports amending local law 181. Um, and I, again, like my colleagues, I'm pleased to hear that um, uh, there is a direction in moving um, toward exempting uh, uh, nonprofit parks uh, conservancies um, so that you can clearly more define your target organizations so as not to unintentionally cause harm and put fundraising efforts at risk for a broad and diverse array of nonprofits that make our city vibrant. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Chair Mateo and, and uh, Councilman uh, Gronicek. Um, my name is Pamela Pettyjohn. I'm the president and founder of Coney Island Beautification Project. Coney Island Beautification Project is comprised of Coney Island residents, advocates of our mission, beautification through organization, education, advocacy, greening, sustainability, resiliency, of our public spaces and waterways. We are grateful for the funding of our councilman, Mark Traeger, and New York City Discretionary Fund. Our initial inclination is to support government transparency, but under the reconsidered law, these reporting necessities are tremendously daunting and overbearing to our small organization, such as, our, such as ours. To vet possible donors, and especially their family and their children, seems overreaching. To request such requirements would be humiliating, which, when soliciting funds, therefore limiting aid for, from potential funders. Please do not handica handicap our fundraising efforts by strangling us with these onerous conditions. And I just wanted to say, that we're not a part of the conservancy, <laughs> but we would love to be a part of a conservancy. Good afternoon, Chairman Mateo, Parks Committee Chairman Grudenchik. I'm Hope Cohen, Chief Operating Officer of the Battery Conservancy, which in partnership with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation maintains, operates, and enlivens the Battery, uh, New York City's birthplace park, uh, at the southern tip of Manhattan. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on, the, on these proposed amendments to Local Law 181. Uh, the draft aims to correct the problem with the drafting. The Conflict of Interest Board uh, has been interpreting. I'm happy to hear today that they uh, may stop interpreting Chapter 9 as applying to nonprofit partners of city agencies, notably but not exclusively park conservancies. Um, at my, as my colleagues at other con conservancies have testified, the Battery Conservancy is neither controlled nor affiliated, neither controlled by nor affiliated with any agent of any elected official in the city of New York. In fact, as a conservancy for a, a park that has multiple overlapping jurisdictions, we have ex officio, um, board members from three levels of government um, and from uh, and, fr and two of those are from the city of New York uh, through the administration of the Parks Department. Two others are from other uh, elected officials, namely the city council and the borough president. And then we have ex officio representatives of the state parks and the national parks. And they are all outnumbered by private uh, private citizen uh, board trustees. They can never, the whole group of them, can never out, outvote the private members, and certainly the New York City members cannot outvote the private members. In no way, shape, and for, or form is our organization controlled by uh, or affiliated with the governing organizations of the city of New York. 
And I think that the first thing that needs to be done, as so many of my colleagues today have uh, expressed, is a clarification and, de and definition um, of affiliated control. It is clear to me, as it is to my colleagues, that when that is appropriately de defined, none of us fall under this legislation. Second, the reporting requirements for organizations that are appropriately ruled by Chapter 9 are extremely burdensome for us to fulfill. That is, if we were, if we were appropriately covered by this legislation, it would be burdensome. The fact that we are not controlled by a government organization makes it not only burdensome, but frankly ridiculous. We appreciate the proposed legislation increases the dollar amount threshold, but it still captures too large a proportion of our donors. We have a single employee responsible for managing donor information and simply cannot take on this administrative work without impacting our ability to raise funds for our mission to welcome the public to a well-maintained park. And here I need to address one of the other uh, comments at previous testimony. We do not control the park. We operate and maintain it in partnership with the city of New York. Control has to do with policy setting for the use of public land. There is no question that our park and every public park in the city of New York has its policies determined by the city of New York. We work in partnership with them to make those par parks more beautiful, more programmed, but we do not control the use of the public space. And I can say about my park that we are, we operate, are open to the public, although our, f our uh, official hours are 19 out of 24 hours a day. The practical reality of our park is that it is open to the public all the time as a commuter hub and an international destination. Third, the requirement for disclosure of donor family relations, relationships is invasive of donor privacy and will doubtless discourage those who would otherwise give. Together, new, the new reporting requirements would significantly decrease the ability of nonprofits like the Battery Conservancy to serve the park, city, and people. By redirecting precious donations, resources to this new reporting, discouraging donors who want their gifts to support the mission of a nonprofit rather than administrative overhead, which is what we're talking about, it's overhead, and discouraging donors who wish to protect the privacy of their family relations. We hope that you will agree that the Battery Conservancy and our colleagues today partner with the city independently of government control. We labor to raise every cent, and I believe these precious resources must be dedicated to the work we do to deliver services to New Yorkers. Good afternoon. I'm Christina Taylor. I'm the executive director for the Friends of Van Cortlandt Park. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Um, at this point, I honestly don't know if we are going to be required to do this or not. I didn't receive a letter until last week when I called the Conflict of Interest Board because I wanted to find out more about this hearing and what was going on, and apparently that put us on their radar, so I immediately got a letter. <laughs> uh, so we are going to be re re yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes ignorance is bliss. Um, so I, I, we will be responding this week, and I'm hoping they agree with us that we do not fall under this. But even if, even if they say we don't, we stand with our colleagues today to say that Parks Conservancies and Friends of Groups should not be required. And I like the way the conversation is leaning about possibly carving us out of this requirement. Um, because the requirement for donors to provide such information as, you know, who their family members are so we can check to see they're doing business with the ci city is an overreach and likely to have a terrible impact on donations that our organizations receive. The law should be limited to nonprofits that are actually controlled or strongly influenced by the city, city officials and donors that give very substantial sums of money to an organization, either a set percentage of a budget or a very high dollar amount. The Friends of Van Cortland Park is the leading fundraising organization for Van Cortland Park, the third largest park in New York City. We carry out vital environmental education and restoration enhancement of the park, its forests and trails. 
We have grown to become the park's primary free educational organization, do doing programs for 6,000 children and adults each year. We're a small organization with only four full-time staff members and a budget under $500,000. We work really hard to make sure that as much of our time and effort can go into the park as possible, which is why I'm the only staff member who spends the majority of the time not in the park and doing paperwork like this. As it's currently written, as, and as the Conflict of Interest Board is interpreting it, it would require a burdensome amount of my time collecting information from our donors who would be reluctant to give it in the first place rather than spending time raising additional dollars that are sorely needed for our park. Furthermore, donors have already expressed their concerns to us that we and we feel that several donors will also decrease their donation amounts to whatever is under the reporting requirement. The mere presence of a few government officials on a board of directors serving as ex officio board members in no way means that an organization is under control of that person or a group of persons. We have a significant ex officio board with elected officials such as our councilmen and appointees such as the Bronx Borough Commissioner, however, and we have one government official on our regular board of directors who's a city employee. That's basically all she is. And routinely takes, uh, but we routine, routinely take odds uh, with the city. We've actually sued the city. Um, while we understand that there are limited groups of nonprofits that are formed by elected officials and, or directly affiliated with them, Parks Conservancy and Friends groups do not fall in that category. If the council insists that a reporting requirement remain, the trigger amount must be increased to capture only the highest level donors, such as $25,000 per year, or be set percentage of an organization's budget. Please allow groups like ours to continue to support our local parks and not spend more time checking off boxes and doing additional paperwork to meet new requirements. We already spent enough time doing this. The Friends of Van Cortland Park wish to continue to spend as much time as possible bringing youth, community, and nature together in our park. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Council Member Gredenchik has a question. Thank you, uh, Chair, again. Thank you. First, let me thank you again um, for spending all this time on this hearing today. Um, I don't get too much legislation before my committee, although we'll probably hold a hearing soon on some of the things that people would like to see done in parks. Um, but I really want to thank Chair Matteo um, for his time today and recognizing how important an issue this is. Uh, for the over 30,000 acres of parkland in the city of New York. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, my first park I visited as chair was Van Cortland. I can tell you a great story about how your park was formed off the record. And um, I have a question. It's all good. All good. Um, I have a question and uh, for Ms. Cohen, though. Have you estimated how much this would cost you? And um, can you tell me first what your budget is, approximately? Our budget is approximately $2.3 million, okay. uh, our operating budget. We have uh, no public money. It is entirely private donations, uh, including some, some grants. I would like to note at this point, since there was some discussion about transparency and reporting, that all of us to today, as far as I know, and certainly we, as, no, as 501c3 nonprofits are required to file a Form 990 with the IRS. It's very helpful for people like me. Okay, and so you know the extent of uh, disclosure that is required for that, for that report. Um, there was some discussion before about the reporting um, that is already required for the COIB, and uh, that is, all of it is onerous. That is less onerous because it is ranges. Um, we, we do it, I think it's twice a year. What we are talking about here is not ranges, but every individual donation. That is, you know, a, a, um, a factor of probably 100 over the, over the, uh, the level that we, the, the level of uh, granular level that we report now. And do you, have you thought about what this would cost you? Your budget's 2.3 million. I would have to hire an employee to do this. So you'd have to hire. So you're yeah. talking at least $50,000? Yeah, Is that a when you amount? counted benefits, yes. Okay. So more than 1% of your entire budget would go to, make 2% would go just to filling out this. That's right. Right, these forms. And that, of course, means that, you know, either we manage to find $50,000 in a new donor, and, of course, donors really don't want to. over here, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> donors really don't want their money to go into administrative overhead. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> as no, we we don't. We always look for. Or charity. we would have yeah. to, you know, cut cut our uh, operational capacity. 
Well, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, uh, really, all of you for being here today. Um, this has been very instructive to me and I know to the members of the committee, and uh, I have heard your voice loud and clear. I also want to thank, of course, COIB for, uh, for their testimony as well. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for indulging me with all my questions today and for this very important legislation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Grudenchik, uh, for being here throughout the hearing. Thank you, Coy, for your testimony, for everyone for attending. Hearings like this take a lot of, a lot of staff work, so I want to thank our legislative team, especially Brad Reed and our Sergeant of Arms, our te technician team, and everyone who uh, helped make this um, hearing a success. And thank you all for attending, and uh, we are closing the hearing now.